mentioned numerous times. On our Matsoi Shabbos, on our Saturday night Zoom and Facebook Live get togethers, that this is a time to share stories, stories of the Baal Shem Tev, it is said, but really stories of Tzadikim. And, you know, I'm a chassid of the Rebbe. I like to share stories about our Rebbe. This is a very old story. It's a very old story. It hails back to the beginning of the Rebbe's inspired leadership. It's a story that took place in the year 1954, and it, this story, was rooted in Israel, but it has wide branches, as you will hear. The story is told by a man whose name was Rebbe Friedman, who has long since passed on to his eternal reward. But I know Leib Friedman's grandchildren, and he's a, he's a real person. And he told the following story. There was a yeshiva in Yerushalayim. I believe it still is a functioning yeshiva, although it is not as prominent as it once was. And the yeshiva is known as Chaye Olam. Yeshiva's Chaye Olam. And the yeshiva Chaye Olam had been functioning for well over a century in 1954. And the Rosh HaYeshiva, the revered head of this academy, is a wonderful man, a man who had a heart that overflowed with compassion and care and concern and sensitivity for all of his disciples. And he was a brilliant, brilliant genius, an incredible educator. And his students literally revered him. They, they held him in the highest esteem. And unfortunately, this Rosh Hashiva was not fortunate enough, did not merit to have good health. His lack of health was primarily in, his, his, uh, 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 in the areas of mobility. And as he began to become older, I don't think he was that old, maybe in his middle 50s or early into his 60s, he had totally lost the ability to walk. In fact, he couldn't even sit. Essentially, he was brought in on a hospital bed, and this is how he would teach Torah. The year is 1954, and he makes a wedding for his son. And he's no longer mobile. Many, many of his disciples from across the land of Israel, and really beyond Israel, came especially because they felt uh, a sense of compassion, a sense of you know, sensitivity for the family that was suffering, a father that could barely function, couldn't walk his son to the chuppah. And the father asked to be carried in his hospital bed, and that's how he participated in this wedding. All of the participants in the wedding rejoiced with the chassan and the kala, as is customary. And words of Torah were spoken. It was a wonderful, beautiful evening. A memorable evening. Towards the end of the evening, the Rosh Hashiva himself asked if he could please say a few words. And of course, the entire wedding hall but fell silent. And a microphone was brought close to the bed of the Rosh Hashiva. And the Rosh Hashiva began to tell the following story. He said, when I was a young man, I was in Poland. And I was studying Torah in a town, a well-known Polish town called Stachin. And in Stachin, he says, there were about 30 boys. We would study Torah in the local synagogue. And in this town of Stachin, there was a local drunk. He was known as, and I'll say it in Yiddish first, Iche der Shiker, Isaac the Drunk. Isaac the drunk used to drink a lot. And then he would invariably fall asleep. He would awaken at some point and reach for the next bottle. And he would fall asleep again. Nobody really was interested in him. The children would mock him and laugh at him. And he was called Ichad the Shikr, Isaac the drunk. And so Isaac the drunk oftentimes would hang around or, might I say, sleep in the synagogue hall where the boys would sit and study. It happens one winter night. Itcha is sleeping on one of the benches, and suddenly a wagon driver enters the study hall and he is deeply distraught. And he tells the yeshiva students that he has a wagon that is filled with material, various dry goods, and the wagon is tipped over. The horse is still attached to the wagon. And the harness is choking the horse. And he says, please, boys, come out and help me. It won't be much for you. We can right the wagon and set the horse free and I can go home. 
I need this horse. I need my wagon, please. And the boys looked at him and they began to discuss this amongst themselves. Are we permitted, they said, to stop the study of Torah? To save a horse? The man's got a livelihood. It's his problem. Are we permitted to stop the study of Torah? And there's this discussion erupts. And this uh, Rosh Hashiva, who is considered to be a senior disciple, who is revered, and the other disciples looked up to him, they decided that uh, was not the appropriate thing to do. Find somebody else. This is a yeshiva. We're studying Torah. I'm sorry. We cannot be bothered. The poor wagon driver, the hapless man, left the synagogue and he went on his way. They, they returned to the Torah study. A short while later, the wagon driver enters from the frosty Polish winter night. And he says, boys, I'm begging you, please, I need your help. I couldn't find anybody else to help me. We're in a desperate situation. The horse is going to choke. He's going to die. I'll be left penniless. Suddenly, Isaac the drunk rouses himself. And he begins to shout. Young men, he says, Bachrim, go immediately and help this yid. Ensure that his horse doesn't choke. And if you will not go, says Icha the Shikar Isaac the drunk, if you will not go, in the future, your legs will no longer carry you. They laughed at him. Oh, the drunk also has something to say. Since when did you become a rabbi? Since when did you become an authority to tell us how to behave? The discussion continued to ensue. The man begged and pleaded, and they decided at some point, I suppose the right thing to do would be to go and help the wagon driver. Unfortunately, it was too late. The horse had already strangled, choked, was no longer alive, and although they righted the wagon, the horse was dead. The next morning, Itcha asks, where is Chaim Chaikel? That is the name of the Rosh Hashiva. Where's Chaim Chaikel? He knew all the names of all the boys. It happened that Chaim Chaikel was not in the synagogue at that time. When he came, the boys said to him, Chaim Chaikel, Itcha was asking about you. So Chaim Chaikel, the Rosh Hashiva, said, I went over to Itcha. I said, Itcha, Isaac, what's up? He said, listen to me. I have a heartfelt plea. Tonight, I'm going to die. I want you to be there when my soul departs from my body. Chaim Chaikel began to laugh. He said, Itcha, what are you talking about? Nobody knows when they're going to die. How could you be so sure you're going to die tonight? Itcha repeated his request. Chaim Chaikel, I want you to be in my apartment when my soul is returned to my maker. Please, please come. I said, where do you live? He said, at the edge of the town of Stachin. At the edge of the town, you'll find a broken down, abandoned area, a broken home. That's where I live. That's the place I call home. Chaim Chaikel didn't really commit. He was non-committal, but as the day wore on, he thought to himself, what do I have to lose? Here's a man who begs me. He says he's dying tonight. Do we get a favor? And so that evening, he set off for, he figured, I'm learning Torah anyway. What does it say? I learned Torah here, I learned Torah there. Chaim Chaikel was a man with a very, very sharp mind, the ability to tune out his environment, his surroundings, and focus on his studies. He figured, I'd go there and study Torah. And so he took his Gemara in hand, and he set off for the edge of town. And there, at the edge of town, he did indeed find a ramshackle broken out hut. He opened the door, and he found Itcha lying on a number of boards. And so he sat on a box of some sort, which clearly was used as a chair, and he began to study Talmud. And there he studied for several hours, and then in the middle he thought to himself, this is crazy. I'm sitting here at the edge of town, freezing, studying Torah. What's the point? And so he closed the Gemara, and he got up to leave, and suddenly it just said, don't go, don't go. I know you're here, don't go. And he said to him, listen to me carefully. At exactly 4 a.m., 4 a.m. on the dot, I'm going to die. I want you to tell the Holy Society, the Hebrew Kaddisha, 
to bury me near, and he names a particular exemplary Torah genius and very, very righteous and revered rabbinic leader of a past generation. I want you to bury me next to him. Chaim Chaikel says, Itch it. Isaac, what are you talking about? You're a drunk. You don't even put on tefillin every day. Itcha becomes agitated and he says, I certainly do put on tefillin. And he says, go into the corner and open that wood box. He opens the box and he sees, he says, look inside, you'll see a pair of tefillin. Indeed, Rabbi Chaim Chaikel, the young man opens the box and he finds a beautiful pair of tefillin there. He was totally taken by surprise. If he would not have seen this with his own eyes, said Chaim Chaikel, I never would have believed it. I said to him, okay, okay, fine. Even if I tell the Chevra Kadisha that they should bury you next to this Gon and Tzadik, they won't listen anyway. So uh, it just says to Chaim Chaikel, look underneath the box with the tefillin and see my writings. You will show my writings to the Chevra Kadisha when they see what I have written, my Torah novelle, then they will understand. Chaim Chaikel, who was an outstanding disciple in Talmud, opened the writings and he recognized that these were deep, mystical concepts, most of which beyond the purview of his understanding. But he suddenly realized that this man is no simple person. He's a hidden tzaddik. At exactly 4 a.m., Itcha passed away. His soul soared heavenward, leaving his body behind immediately. At 4 a.m., this young Talmudic scholar ran to the rabbi of the town of Stachin in the Hebra Kadisha, and he told him everything that had transpired over the last few hours. They said to him, it is impossible. In the old section, the old cemetery is already full. We haven't been burying anybody there for decades. But Chaim Chaikel said, Itcha insisted, and he seems to be a tzaddik nister. So they went back, and to everybody's shock and surprise, in the old cemetery, there was one grave empty, one spot empty, and it was next to the particular righteous rabbi that this secret tzaddik, that this itcha, had mentioned. And so, the Rosh Hashiva concluded and he said, this was clearly a very holy man. And he said, I am certain, I am certain that this holy man has everything to do with the fact that I cannot walk. He said, you can't even imagine what happened in Stachin when the story got out. It was a huge funeral. Everybody came and honored this man. And he said, I still hear his words in my ears. The feet that will not go and help the person who needs assistance, whose wagon had turned over, those feet will not walk. And the Rosh Hashiva said, I am certain it is because of the curse of that hidden tzaddik that that's the reason that I am sick and I cannot walk. The one who tells the story that Blade Friedman says that ha the, the wedding was so suddenly no longer joyous and there was a tremendous amount of sympathy and people felt so bad for this man as he wept and then he wept along with him. And he says, I also was very touched by his story and I decided to write a letter to the Rebbe and share the entire story with our Rebbe. It's 1954, only three years after the Rebbe said his first mimer. The Rebbe responded immediately and he said, tell this Rosh Hashiva that if he will accept upon himself to follow the injunction of the previous Rebbe, my father-in-law, to learn every day a portion of Chumash, that is on the first day of the week from the beginning of the parsha until Sheni, on Monday from Sheni to Shlishi and so on and so forth, to recite a portion of Tehillim as is divided into 30 sections for every day of the month. And if it's a month of 29 days, you recite the 29th and 30th section on the last day of the month. And to study a portion of Tanya as it is apportioned over the year from Yutas Kislev to Yutas Kislev, that if he will do this, and if he will encourage all of his disciples to do this, the Rebbe said, I promise him that in the merit of this, he will walk again. Rebbe Friedman hurried to Yerushalayim to Meyasharim and he brought the Rosh Hashiva of Chai Oilam this letter. 
The Rosh Hashiva of Chayyolam read the letter over carefully, and with great joy he began to kiss the letter. And he said, I commit to learning Chitas, Chumash, Tilam, and Tanya, and I will inspire others and cajole and encourage them to do same. And so it was, and so it was, my friends, that Rosh Hashiva began to learn Chitas. And many others followed his plea, his request. In fact, the Blade Friedman relates that every time somebody would come visit the Rosh Hashiva, the Rosh Hashiva would say to them, please, my welfare depends on this. Hundreds, perhaps thousands of people began to study Chitas. And this Rosh Hashiva was able to have his health restored. He no longer was in a bed. Eventually, he even got out of the wheelchair and he's walking. His mobility was totally restored. The doctors could not understand it. But this is the story that happened in 1954. And I encourage each of you, as I started a little Fabrengen, that this is a time not only to prepare for the receiving of the Torah, but now is the time to commit ourselves to study Torah. To study Torah. 